Hello, I'm Ryan Beasy. This is the Westminster Standard Podcast. As we begin a new year, now is a great time to make plans about books you might read in the coming months. As last year was the 50th anniversary of the PCA's founding, many of us were reflecting with thanksgiving and hope on what God has done in the Presbyterian Church in America. And at the end of last year, I sat down with ruling elder Melton Duncan, one of the preeminent students of history in the PCA, to ask him to talk me through the various histories that have been written on our beloved communion. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation and be encouraged not only because of God's faithfulness to the PCA, but also be encouraged perhaps to read one of these books in the coming year as we press onward together toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, today I am joined by ruling elder Melton Duncan of the Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina, and we're going to spend some time talking about uh, the history of uh, the PCA. Uh, Mel, thanks for being on. Ryan, it is a delight to be here with you on the podcast, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Me too. Well, tell me about uh, growing up in the PCA and and the PCUS for a little bit. what, how, what was your path to becoming a ruling elder? When did you discern that call? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, Ryan, I am one of those rare birds uh, who grew up in the PCA and uh, have never really known anything but uh, this expression of Christ and his church and am grateful for her and in, in many ways in the product of many different people in, in the PCA. I, I feel like I have many different spiritual fathers and mothers out there and and a lot of good friends throughout the church. Uh, I'm a child of the 1970s. Uh, My mom and dad uh, were good parents and they loved the Lord and they loved their children. And uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, their uh, three sons uh, uh, grew up in the church. And so every time the door was open, we we were there. Uh, I never particularly felt like it was a hard thing to do. I, from a very young age, I enjoyed uh, being in, in church and, and I enjoyed being a part of the church. And uh, I was greatly blessed by the way in which I saw both mom and dad serve. Uh, dad was an elder and my whole life, uh, I just remember him in that capacity. I remember the way in which he enjoyed uh doing that he enjoyed being a part of the deliberative process he enjoyed the hands-on relationship parts of it uh he dutifully did the business parts of it um and he enjoyed talking about it it was very easy and enjoyable in in a lot of ways to talk about the church uh, because my dad included me in those conversations and helped me understand and helped me to learn to think and my mom, likewise, was a very dedicated uh, Christian mother. Uh, my mom was, for a number of years, uh, the music director at Second Presbyterian Church. And uh, she used to joke uh, that uh, the first time uh, she was asked to serve as the interim music director, that lasted 18 years. Uh, the second time, that lasted nine years. And the third time, I think, was only five years. But essentially, most of my adult life, mom was involved with music and so uh back in those days that meant uh, being a part of children's choirs and uh in adult choirs <clears throat> actually just at lunchtime today had this conversation with my youngest daughter uh, she's been asked to sing in the our chancel choir which is our adult choir that sings on sunday mornings and we were having that age-old discussion between a father and a child uh, about doing something that we don't want to do. And um, she said something to me that I probably said to my own mother 40 some years ago in which I communicated, you know, I really don't want to sing in the choir. And I said something to my daughter that I suspect my mother uh, probably said to me, which is, I understand, honey, but you're going to sing in the choir. And in some ways, Ryan, that's been my whole uh, experience in the church. I've done some things that maybe I didn't understand or I didn't want to do, but I did it. And by God's grace, it became a great blessing to me. And I've I've enjoyed trying to help it be a blessing to others. Um, the, The church is not plan B. And it's not something that mankind came up with. It's, it's actually what God ordained 
for us to be a part of from the very foundation of the world. And it's an institution, maybe the only institution that's going to last from this world to the next. And it seems like we ought to figure out a way as best we can by God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit to make it work. And in God's kindness and providence, 50 some years ago, uh, our PCA founding fathers came together in Birmingham and began a new endeavor called the initially the National Presbyterian Church and then the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America. And we're on a journey together and, and we've had some really, uh, this has been a, a year and a month and even a week of celebration. Uh, in the life of the PCA, and the Lord has done some marvelous things amongst us, and there is so much good to thank the Lord for and to celebrate, and I think that God, even in the things that we disagree with about, I think the Lord is making us a, a more holy people, uh, a more useful people, and I think a more Presbyterian people, and I think those are all uh, mutually uh, reinforcing things. And uh, I'm excited to talk with you today about the history of the PCA. I'm, I'm thrilled, of course, to talk to you about uh, the, not just the history, but uh, the people of the PCA. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned to you, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. My home church is the Second Presbyterian Church of Greenville. Uh, we, we've joked for many years at Second that, uh, that uh, men's ministry is becoming an officer. And so there, you sort of grew up with an expectation at second that if you were uh, gonna do your part when you got to a certain age and uh, you exhibited a certain level of maturity that you would, you, you just began to serve. And so uh, after my uh, young adulthood uh, uh, days uh, were drawing to a conclusion, uh, in my mid twenties, I, I began serving as a deacon and uh, then a few years later was elected an elder. So uh, I've been serving as an elder for about 30 years now, or, or as an officer for about 30 years now, and as an elder for about 20 plus years, and and uh, have loved every bit of it. Um, Wonderful. A church is a uh, institution not unlike a hospital. You get to see people at their very best at times, and then sometimes you get to come alongside them at their very lowest points. Mm -hmm. and uh really all we can do as our book of church order instructs us to do is to minister and declare god's word to a lost and dying world and to do it decently in good order and uh, to worship according to his words by the way he's told us to uh and to love one another into heaven and uh, i love i love talking about the church with people and again i'm thrilled to be with you today oh that's that's thrilling um yeah, I, I love that we're more holy, more useful, and more Presbyterian. Um, that's that's wonderful. Uh, so you are a, a ruling elder and on staff full time at a yep. church. I was talking um, earlier with uh, Burke Parsons, who was uh, professing his love for ruling elders and mm -hmm. um, you know, how he even the way he speaks about his session that you know they're they're not my elders. I serve with them. Yeah, and and you know, what is what are ways. Um, that Second Pres has developed and deployed her ruling elders. What's your current yeah. role there? Yeah. Well, uh, Second is a 131 year old, 132 year old, uh, multi generational uh, church that I like to say is both old, new, and reformed. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we express all of that is in the life of our officers. We have about uh, 17 ruling elders varying from uh, men in their 80s to men down in their 40s who uh, commit to a lifetime calling of serving in a particular local church uh, within the PCA. And um, th that involves um, a variety of different uh, commitments and it, it involves leadership, service, duty, uh, and in hospitality. And uh, some of the men are really good at some parts of that, those things. Others are really good at other parts of those things. And together, uh, we jointly rule 
uh, Second Presbyterian Church. The, the BCO has that wonderful little expression, jointly, not severally. And uh, the big things in the life of the church uh, are decided upon through mutual agreement and decision and, and resolution uh, by the elders when they're gathered together in session. Mm -hmm. um, Burke uh, has some good ruling elders in, in St. Andrews uh, down in, in Lake Mary. We have some great ruling elders here in Greenville and they come from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, in, in Greenville, you, you tend to have a lot of, it's an engineer type city. So we have a group of men on the, on the session who are engineers. They're good at analyzing things and fixing things and developing systems and strategies. Uh, we have uh, architects, uh, we have doctors, we have lawyers, uh, we have ordinary businessmen. Uh, it, it, there's just a variety of different life experiences. Uh, some are young fathers, some are um, retired. We have a, a several widowers. And together, those life experiences through uh, God-ordained men uh, do a pretty good job of representing and leading this particular church. Um, second is in some ways um, kind of a throwback uh, in that uh, people, you hear people talk about the 80-20 rule for churches. We, we don't have an 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of the people don't do all the work here. Uh, really, almost everybody does something. And uh, in, in the course of our history, we've just had some remarkable people who've, who've run with different ministries, with different um, uh, obligations and things in the church. And, and so everybody is contributing. It really is a priesthood of all believers kind of culture here. But in recent years, the church uh, under Dr. Richard Phillips' ministry, the Lord has blessed us and we've grown. And the, the session decided to add a, a new position, uh, which they called me to serve in, and they call me the church administrator. Now, now, traditionally, a church administrator does finances or facilities. What I really do is, is I'm a ruling elder serving like an executive pastor. So I'm, in, so I'm involved with, with helping the senior minister, um, helping to facilitate ministry, uh, through our programs and then working with our volunteers. And uh, I like to say that really what I do is I pray, I'm aware of things, I remember uh, events and, and obligations, and I recruit people to serve. Th those are really the four main things that I do. And uh, Dr. Phillips has a broader ministry and so i'm privileged to help him in parts of that um we're one of those old-fashioned churches where our uh, we do things through committees and so there are eight sessional committees and five diaconal committees and then we have an active women's ministry and so one of my tasks is simply to go to those meetings and to help resource those committees to do uh, the things that they've been structured and, and led by the elders to to direct to do. And so I try to make sure that we're cooperating with one another, that the Christian Education Committee knows what the Missions Committee is doing so that they won't do things on top of one another. Uh, and then I just try to be a good resource to the session as a whole. I, I've actually, in my position, tried to look at the way PCA coordinators were originally intended to function. They're, they're not uh chief presbyterian officers their 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 resource and staff uh leaders and servants and so their job is to empower the committees uh that they're privileged to coordinate uh without directing or subduing them in some way and so um my work shows up through the work of the elders and the deacons and the members of second church and it's it's a lot of fun uh, you, some, some of this is just straight up ministries. A little of this is business. Uh, a lot of this is organization and planning. Uh, and a, a church is, uh, is not a business. It's more like a neighborhood. Sometimes it's like a farm. 
Uh, you, you've got to think long term about things. You've got to do a lot of planning. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of fun to work with the volunteers and the officers and the other staff members to try to do those things. So I've been doing that here at Second since about 2012. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I had a background in commercial printing and uh, our, in our commercial printing business, I did a lot of work for nonprofit organizations in Greenville and that touched on media. And I also did some development work for some Christian organizations over the years. So all of those things together, I think, helped helped me in this position. Um, I was a little bit of a guinea pig for, uh, for the church in the sense that we never had a, a full time non-ordained person. Uh, and um, and that's been fun to sort of work through that. Uh, so but that, you are uh, ordained. Well, I, well, a, a non-teaching elder ordained. Thank yeah. you, thank but, you. I, but, I but what you've affirm, been describing is very passionate. Well, I want to, I want to affirm the the two office view on the podcast here. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I would like to think that um, that I'm acting in an ordained capacity uh, in in a somewhat novel way. But really, all I'm trying to do is to empower the the elders and the deacons to do their work here in the church. Yes, and I just love to hear how ruling elders are, are serving in the church, and would love to see our denomination use ruling elders as in in more shepherding roles, um, not just as a board or or folks who maybe go on a visit once a year to a congregations, but in the life of the church. And I, I love yeah. to hear what you're doing and exemplifying that. Well. Uh, the, the PCA uh, has a stated, uh, uh, not just an aspiration, but an expectation that ruling and teaching elders will serve equally in leadership capacities in the church. And so um, I have tried to, to serve, uh, you know, early on just volunteering to go to Presbytery and General Assemblies and to participate in national uh, program committees and, and committee of commissioners at GA and permanent committees uh, throughout the year. I've just volunteered when when available. When I ask, I've, I've just showed up and, and tried to go to work. And I've tried to find things that I enjoyed doing, um, ministries that I enjoyed. Uh, I served a number of years in leadership with the college ministry committee and then uh, administration and, and different things. And um, you, you may know, Ryan, that I enjoy doing, being a part of the resolution of thanks each year at GA. I like kind of weaving in history and, uh, the process of formally ending the assembly each year. So, uh, th those are things that I've just pursued because I've enjoyed doing that. And, and then in, in terms of how do we get more ruling elders involved, the, there's, there's a several answers to that. One is we've got to, um, teaching elders have to lovingly lead uh, ruling elders into involvement. And that oftentimes just means showing and telling, uh, bringing them along, talking with them, helping them understand. Uh, you know, in recent years, Ryan, the, the PCA has had legitimate uh, controversy and debate. <clears throat> and it's been wonderful to see how ruling elders have shown up in in greater numbers than we've ever had them, uh, you know, by hundreds more each year because they want to be a part of those national discussions. They want to be a part of shaping the, the church. And I, I think that uh, the, the sort of godly controversy that we've had has actually caused ruling elders to step up in recent years. And my hope is that that trend will continue for years to come. Uh, an involved ruling elder usually has the, the fingerprints on him of a godly father figure teaching elder who has shown him how to be involved and, and to participate in the life of the church. And that's something that we've got to do in our local churches. Um, and, and the best way to do that is to get guys to go to Presbytery and get them serving and talk with them about it and to show them the spiritual significance of it. Indeed. Well, your father had a, had a crucial role in the formation of the PCA, at least uh, in, in upstate South Carolina. And um, I, I'd love to hear about his, his work traveling around the country. Uh, yeah. Uh, dad, in, to, in some ways, dad was an ordinary ruling elder. 
uh, he, uh, the, the Lord brought a, a godly minister to Second Church Greenville named Gordon Reed. Gordon had been all, active in helping get RTS started, had been uh, very active in the early days of the PCA. And uh, Gordon uh, really made an impact on on my father. And, and so dad and other ruling elder, another ruling elder here, Stuart Patterson, um, became uh, very active in the early days of the PCA. Um, in those days, that meant participating in either concerned Presbyterian meetings, reading your Presbyterian journal, going to journal day up in Weaverville. Uh, it, it meant uh, trying to serve on denominational committees. It, it meant uh, keeping up with Presbyterian Churchmen United and networking with uh, PEF, Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship Missionaries. And it meant talking with people in our region and in local churches about the need for reform uh, and the need to challenge the uh, PCUS to, to, to change its ways. And so uh, dad participated in discussions and traveled uh, to different meetings and, and was a part of those early meetings and discussions and went, went to those organizational meetings and participated as a backbencher uh, in, in the venture uh, of forming the PCA. He attended the, the meetings in Asheville and Atlanta that preceded the Birmingham GA. And then he was in it in Birmingham in December of 73 uh, when, the P, when the PCA, what became the PCA was formed. And then he served in some of those early committees. There was a real excitement at the beginning of the PCA of we're doing something new. We're 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 um, stepping out uh, by what we believed was a call from God to, but it, nevertheless stepping out somewhat blindly in this new endeavor. And there were all sorts of um, uh, just. It, it, I've often described it. Ryan is it was almost like the Continental Congress you know men would kind of come in and there, there was no headquarters there was no there, it was just men and and they would come together and, and pray and discuss and deliberate and in those early days there were lots of really interesting study committees and and discussions about what the PCA was going to look like and what were we going to be known for and dad did his part to be a part of that dad was part of a study committee that actually looked at the whole two office three office question uh and there were other committees as well that he participated in and early on dad used his gifts of administration uh to be a part of um helping the ga arrangements committee uh he would go uh with the pca administrator and and help do the logistics of setting up an event in different cities and uh, so in my earliest days, I, I just remember always going to GA. And uh, now when, when I was in my younger days, I, I'll admit I was more excited about the hotel pool and whatever uh, children's events had been had been set up. But uh, as I got older, I got more interested in the in the work itself. And several of those early assemblies, I remember going in and, and trying to wrestle with what are they talking about and just found it very interesting and enjoyed watching dad serve in that way. And great training for uh, your own uh, ministry as an elder. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Well, um, what uh, key figures and, and families were involved in the PCA that might be, you know, overlooked? You know, we, we, we certainly remember the, the big names, but are there other families yeah. that you can think of? You know, that family is, and yeah. has really blossomed in the yeah. PCA. You know, I was thinking about that today, Ryan. Uh, we've we've had some wonderful celebrations of some of the magisterial PCA founders, um, and I've enjoyed every one of them. I, I think we may have underplayed Dr. Morton Smith in some of these founders. I, I when I look back, I saw that you had done the the Morton Smith event. I appreciate you doing that. Um, people tend to just know Dr. Smith through caricature. But I appreciate how you showed uh, the world what just what a gracious man he was. He was a good humble, man in so many ways. Under spoke, you know, just yeah, just yeah, just, so true, so true. I I have some fond memories of uh, uh, he. Sometimes when he would come to Greenville, he would spend the night at our house, 
And I just have some fond memories of watching basketball games with him and talking with him. And, and you know, I never found him to be uh, this uh, uh, anything but a, a kinder, older gentleman. And I enjoyed my visits with him over the years. Um, but I, I think the, the group of people maybe that's gotten most left out has probably been all the clerks who served the PCA, the, the session clerks, the presbytery clerks, the recording clerks. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we relish, rightly so, being a bottom-up Presbyterian church. That only works when men do all the labor of networking and building a docket, of communicating well, of following up well, of reminding people well of committees and and dates and and due due dates of things and uh, we we've been well served over the years by by many many oftentimes it's a retired minister who's uh, someone who knows the presbytery well and is a good relational person who brings people together and helps make people uh, you know work through issues together and. I, I think the the unsung uh, the unsung hero of the PCA is probably the faithful clerk, uh, and and there's so many of them. I, I was looking back through some of the founders. One that comes to mind that I think I've not heard mentioned is John Spencer, who for many years was at the Birmingham Briarwood Church, uh, was an original uh, clerk for the PCA. He was a recording clerk at the first GA and. He's an example of, of just hundreds of different men that have helped keep the PCA on the same page over the years. So I'm going to fly my flag today for, for the ordinary PCA clerk. For the clerks. Wonderful. Well, um, you know, we th- there have been a number of histories uh, that have been written about the PCA. Your family, as you mentioned, has a history in the publishing industry. I think you've published some of the early histories yeah. of uh, yeah. of the PCA. Would you tell me about you know about them? Um, yeah, the, there are a couple. I, I have sort of my, my list here of PCA books. I thought I'd go through a few of them. Um, there are a couple of them that we had some involvement with that might be of interest. Um, This is a book that has provoked some controversy over the years. This is John E. Richards, Historical Birth of the PCA. Uh, It's it's an important book to read because it shows you an example of an early PCA leader, and it really helps you understand his motivations for why he is a a minister at First Press Macon in the 1960s was motivated to get involved in starting a new church. And it's going to reflect some of the spirit of the age concerns and problems that we would have today. But it's also going to show overall a man who is not reacting to his culture, but who's motivated by an understanding of Presbyterian polity and Reformed theology. Though one might say in a way uh, maybe that we've done better at in some ways as a PCA going forward. I. I like to tell young seminarians that however frustrated you may be with the PCA today, it's so much better theologically than it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's because we've had good reformed seminaries that have promoted the doctrines of grace, uh, the solas of the Reformation, and Presbyterian and reformed categories in a way that that first generation of PCA founders coming out of Columbia Seminary or the PCUS tradition would not have been exposed to. And so this is a good starting place for people, the historical birth of the PCA. I think this is something you can still get at the PCA bookstore. This was a book that my dad published for Reverend Richards 30, 40 years ago. Um, this is a book that, that I actually had a little bit of hand in, but it was written by Bob Canada and Jack Williamson, the, the really two of the premier ruling elder uh, figures in the early days of the PCA. And it's called The Historic Polity of the PCA. Now, I think you can get this at First Press Jackson if you call to them. Uh, but it really outlines the case for bottom-up Presbyterianism. This is, a, this is an idea in which the, the PCA was not ever going to affirm or allow a top-down central government bureaucracy. 
Uh, and it's going to, you know, if you want to know why we love chapter 25 in the Book of Church Order and why we uh, have the Presbytery in many ways as the highest theological court, uh, you're going to see the reasoning and arguments for that uh, in Mr. Canada and Mr. Williamson's book. Jack Williamson taught polity at RTS. You probably had him at some point, uh, Ryan, or maybe he was a few years before you. Yeah, and of course, Bob not. Canada was one of the great uh, ruling elders in the history of the church who was involved in the starting of RTS as well as a number of other things. But that's a good book for people to be aware of as well. You know, there's so many good books uh, to celebrate uh, the PCA. Um, I think when you when you start your journey into understanding the PCA, you really have to begin with Morton Smith's How the Gold Has Become Dim. And this is something that the founders went to Dr. Smith and asked him to develop the official uh, textus receptus of continuing Presbyterianism. And what he's doing is just kind of laying out for you uh, some of the, the, the polity issues that were rooted in theological problems in the old church. And this becomes really the argument for the PCA. And this is a good place for people to begin in their understanding of what was the decline in Southern Presbyterianism? Where, mm. what is that? What did that mean? What did that look like? Uh, Dr. Smith was the amanuensis of continuing Presbyterianism. And you really have to begin with that to understand the PCA. A lot of other great books out there. Um, I, I, would, I would mention several. Um, Frank Smith's uh, book on the history of the PCA, and this is his updated one, which again, <clears throat> you could get at the PCA bookstore, is probably um, the most technical history and probably is has the most data out there in terms of naming names and naming events and naming uh, you know bills and overtures and, and getting into the nitty gritty uh, it almost reads like a congressional record mm. uh, of of the early days of the PCA. It, it mentions names and dates and events and court cases, and it, it's probably the most uh, full uh, book on the PCA. And again, he did an updated version. This is the silver anniversary issue of Frank Smith's History of the PCA, and he's an interesting figure. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. A lot of people don't remember Frank. Um, Frank anticipated Frank, Frank was a man ahead of his time. He he was almost like a blogger or a podcaster a generation before those things even existed. And uh, my library is falling uh, down around us here. And um, Frank did a lot of documentation and ruffled a lot of feathers and asked a lot of questions and caused people to think through, um, you know, why are we doing what we're doing and, and, and according to who? And uh, he's, he's an important person to read. He's a useful person to understand. And uh, his book is, is most in, invaluable for people. To um, some years ago, our friend Don Clements wrote a little book called a Presbyterian primer, uh, the historical roots of the PCA. And this is almost like a, a, I could see it being like a membership class to a PCA church kind of book. It, it sort of discusses where does Presbyterianism come from in its historical context. And then it has a brief summary of the founding of the PCA. And it talks about the joining and receiving of the RPCES in the 1980s, and that's a good little book to read. Um, the PCA has had a historic archive since the early 90s, and they produced several little books over the years. Uh, Jerry Cornegay was an RPCS brother who produced this book called The Living History of the PCA. And then uh, Ray Heipel produced this book, uh, uh, CDM publishes it called A Pocket History of the PCA that's very well done. And then some of our institutions that serve the PCA, RUF produced this little 
booklet. Um, it's kind of like a Puritan title. It has a whole sentence uh, <clears throat> for a title, Pressing uh, Towards the Goal of the Upward Call of God, Reform University Ministries, A History of RUM at the Millennium. And it kind of tells the stories of the early figures who were involved in starting RUF from its early days at Southern Miss and Hattiesburg to a work of Mississippi Valley Presbytery to a subcommittee of MA to now a denominational agency uh, program committee. And uh, sort of all the, for RUF people, this would be interesting because it reminds you of some of those wonderful figures from the history of, of RUF uh, over the years. And then, of course, you can't do PCA history now without Sean Lucas being front and center. So uh, these are the two classic popular uh, books on PCA history, on being a Presbyterian, and then his recent book for a continuing church, uh, which are, are, are ideal for folks to read and to know about. And uh, it, it's a fantastic place, even if you don't, you're not a seminarian, it, it, it's a good book to read to understand where you've come from. Um, Paul Settle did a wonderful um, uh, history of the PCA uh, that I'm trying to think if I have back here. I think I, I used it in master training and it's upstairs, but there it is, uh, To God All Praise and Glory and that's just an excellent book, which shows you the people and personalities in those early years. Um, Ligon did a little book on women's ministry in the local church, which I think does a very good job of reflecting uh, the godly complementarian foundations mm -hmm. of the PCA's early commitment to what was known then as women in the church, WIC. And uh, it, it really is just a good description of how women uh, are indispensable and how they biblically serve and lead within PCA churches. And then a recent addition to PCA books of note is David Hall's, uh, and it's a very David Hall title, Irony and the Presbyterian Church in America. And I, I was asked to, to comment on this to somebody the other day, and I said, it's almost like David took all of his denominational reports from GA that he had given at different churches and kind of strung them together to write a book. If, if you understand David's critique of the PCA and you want to see it laid out in a systematic pattern, this is a great place to get that. It really does show a, a sort of a confessional assessment of the PCA from a generational perspective, and it's well worth purchasing. I have both the hardback and the paperback uh, edition, uh, and, and it's well worth uh, being aware of and, and reading. So those are some books that are out there. Uh, if, if you love the PCA, one or all of those would be good reads for you. Yes, yes. Uh, I got to read through David Hall's uh, book, uh, quite recently and I, I was blown away you know some of the 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 names that he named there you know the men that that are pillars now but read about them uh and their work in the in the 90s and how uh, they, they've stayed true to their commitments uh over these over the 50 years yeah. um, well based on your uh knowledge of of our history which is extensive mm -hmm. what do you anticipate will be the the key issues for the PCA over the next 50 years or maybe just the next decade? You know, Ryan, uh, Tim Keller and Ligon did a, a famous talk at a GA and, and this has been used over the years, the doctrinalist, pietist and uh, culturalist segments of the PCA. I, I think the doctrinalists and the pietists have actually been growing closer together in recent years. And I think they have found some interesting common ground in the life of the church in recent years. And I think the culturalists have been growing a little ways apart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by culturalist, um, I'm not either talking about a progressive or a conservative. I'm, I'm talking about people committed to transformationalism from whatever point of view. I, 
I think there's been something of a of a theological urgency in the life of the church, whether it be straight up egalitarianism, whether it be the federal vision, whether it be uh, the the late unpleasantness and revoice. I think you've seen the PCA react in a Presbyterian way to each of those. And I think that has actually caused uh, some of the doctrinalists and the pietists to have good conversations with one another. Um, So I I think in some ways um, that's that's a good sign. Um, I think the PCA has, has done a very good job uh, in in the most recent era of having some of these hard theological conversations, and I'm actually very thrilled with with what what we've been able to do. Uh, the PCA is not a monolith, but I think on certain issues we've done a very good job of modeling theological dialogue uh, on hard hard issues. Um, I I am not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I don't really do good on the predictions game. I suspect that the egalitarian conversation is going to continue on, Mm. uh, Ryan. Um, And it's not that I necessarily want it to. I just think that's probably an era of unsettledness. Um, I think we've always struggled to have worship conversations with one another in the PCA. uh, And we have formally agreed not to agree on that. Uh, but what I would like to see happen is for the different, uh, you know, tribes within the church to continue talking to one another about that. Uh, part three of the of the BCO is a wonderful pastoral, theologically rich and useful paradigm that all PCA churches should be using. And I, I like the conversations that are happening about that. Um, I, I think God has been very good to the PCA in that we continue to grow. Um, my pastor likes to say one of the great uh, kind providences of God is that the PCA sits at the intersection of Reformed theology and, and true biblical evangelicalism. We're, we're about the free offer of the gospel while at the same time upholding the doctrines of grace. and. I, I hope that will allow us to continue to grow. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, someone like a Kevin DeYoung in the life of the PCA who can do fantastically uh, uh, difficult, dense Presbyterian theology in a very conversational and relatable way. And I think we're living in an era right now where Calvinism is still very attractive to people because we're an open source uh, document. People can go in and read our footnotes and see the history of our ideas. And we didn't just make this stuff up and we're not program driven. And I, I think this continues to be an ideal age for denominations just like the PCA because we've got a lot to say We're not afraid of our history. We're pretty good at expository preaching still. And I think the Lord's going to continue to to use that and hopefully bless it and grow it. Um, My pastor will oftentimes tell my home church that we're living in an age, it would seem, where the the Lord is using the, the wealthier nations of the West to resource the global South, because one day soon, the light of Christendom is not going to reside in North America, but it's gonna be in Asia, Africa, or Latin America. And so, you know, we get excited about Second Press when we hear about our missions partners in the global South, utilizing what we do to help them in their ministry. And I think the PCA as a whole does that kind of thing really well. And I'm excited about that. I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, You know, Ryan, the the PCA 
is not unlike the family at Thanksgiving, that for some of us, it's the only time of year that we sit around the table to one another and have to talk with one another. Um, in, in recent years, those hard family discussions have gone pretty well, in my judgment. And I think we just need to keep having them and, and keep talking. Well, in that vein, um, there are calls for unity, but it seems like sometimes these calls for unity are actually plead, pleas for latitude. How can yeah. we encourage true unity and not latitude, but unity around our shared confession, what the PCA confesses to be the teaching of Scripture? Well, um, y- unity has to be rooted in, in truth. Mm. And I, I think the, the best way to do that is, of course, to be faithful in your local church, to be doing the work of the Great Commission, upholding an inerrant scripture, uh, you know, being a vital part of the Reformed faith. I mean, our, our unofficial motto is the solution to that proposition that you just asked me. Uh, those are things that have united the PCA together from day one. They're good and godly things that we all ought to be doing. Um, Ryan, the, the, the best way for the PCA to go forward are for people on all sides of the issues to make arguments, not appeals to authority or uh, emotional um, dalliances. And I think that good arguments are useful ways of forging consensus. And I, I mean, let, let's just take the, the, the Book of Church Order revisions related to qualifications for officers. We have been in the crucible of how to make the BCO better for five years now because someone thought it was a good idea to promote a side B gay Christianity. And the PCA has in an almost monolithic way, I like to say there's not a Sunday school teacher in the PCA that thinks side B gay Christianity is a good idea, not a one of them. And, uh, you know, that, that reaction to that has caused us to really improve our BCA. And it, it's caused us not simply to think about the one particular issue involved in side B gay Christianity, but appropriate ways to consider Christian experience and call to ministry issues for all ministers and officers. And I think those uh, general assemblies have actually made the PCA a lot better. Uh, the, the study committee report uh, on sexuality, the 12 points, have been fantastic. And I like that. And my hope is that as we wrestle with new issues in the years to come, that this consensus that we've made, that the culturalists are going to have to listen to the doctrinalists, and the doctrinalists are going to have to listen to the pietists, and together we're going to faithfully apply the Westminster standards, is going to make the PCA get even better. Well said. Well said. So uh, continuing that line of thought, what excites you about the PCA uh, right now? Um, yeah, uh, young voices excite me. Um, the, the Gospel Reformation Network excites me. Uh, there, there just are so many good, godly young voices of men who are motivated by deep understandings of theology and a passion for the lost. And they, they care about the church. And they don't care about it in a self-platforming way. They care about it and they genuinely love the church. And they're, they're willing to do the hard work of making the church better. The, the young voices in the PCA really excite me. Um, so many of our seminaries excite me, Ryan. I mean, they're, all of our seminaries have a story to tell. But what's going on at RTS, what's going on at Westminster, here locally in Greenville, I just, I love the leadership of these places. Mm. I love the hundreds of men that are coming here to these seminaries to study. I love the philosophies of ministry and the quality of the faculty and the scholarship and the embracing of Presbyterian categories and 
language that these seminaries teach. This greatly excites me. Um, you know, I, I like the, the, the way in which uh, the PCA has responded to COVID is something that excites me. I love the fact that PCA churches, without wearing it on our sleeve, found a way to worship God and when necessary to remind the civil magistrate, you know, what we're going to do. And I think the Lord has blessed that. I know he's blessed it in our church. I say that not out of pride and I'm just saying the Lord. We, we've had people visit our church from non-reformed traditions, from like mainline Protestant type folks in numbers I've never seen before because we did something in a godly way that was countercultural, and that excites me. Um, you, you know, those are some things that excite me, Ryan. I, I'm hopeful about the future of the PCA because God ordained for the church to be his vessel of redemption in this age. And I, I love the idea of being part of an institution that's going to endure and being a part of an institution that reorients us around God and the way God intended us to, to be. And so I'm generally hopeful for the PCA. I'm bullish on it right now because I think godly men are stepping up and the church is, is growing in useful ways. Um, a friend of mine who used to minister in Las Vegas used to tell me about how moving to Las Vegas was the greatest source of sanctification in his life. And I used to say that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. And he said, Mel, no, it's, it's because you can't, th there was no social advantage to being a Christian in a place like Las Vegas. You really had to want to do it. Uh, you know, in a place like Greenville, if you're a banker in town, you're going to casually let slip that you go to such and such a, a non-denominational church or such and such a Southern Baptist church. And there still is some residual social benefit. Uh, but in many places in North America, uh, we're now in a negative view world of the Christian church and Christian people. And so the PCA authentically expressing godliness and the inerrant scripture and a passion for evangelism, God's going to bless that. And he's going to bless officers in the PCA learning their Westminster Confession and catechisms. And he's going to bless men learning basic Robert's rules of order so they can make an argument in an, order, in an orderly way. And he's going to bless people uh, showing up and volunteering to serve on committees and helping agencies and committees do a better job of articulating the reform faith and practicing it in a better way. And my hope is that the PCA is going to get better and better and that he's going to be pleased to use uh, imperfect sinners uh, like me and many others uh, to be a part of the PCA story. Uh, PCA is only 50 years old, Ryan, and yet look at what we've been able to do. We've grown. Uh, we, we've often talked about the special uh, loud voices, the Tim Kellers, the Harry Readers, the, the R.C. Sprouls, the D. James Kennedy. But think about all the ordinary godly pastors out there who are making a difference. You've probably seen this meme online about the four theologians, you know, that have been, I love all the guys who've just shown the ordinary pastors in their, in their life. The, for me, the Gordon Reeds, the, the Paul Settles, uh, the Rick Phillips, uh, because those are the people who are going to transform uh, the world is, is your pastor. And hopefully a few ruling elders as well, helping the senior minister do his work. Um, there are plenty of things to be negative and worried about in the PCA. But right now, I would just say to you in this year of anniversary, let's just be grateful for, by God's grace, how far we've come and be hopeful that we can go a little further until the Lord returns. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. That what what an encouragement! What a what a vision you've set out for the next uh, for the next fifty years. Well, the 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 vision we have, uh, thankfully, is a faith once delivered. Right, 
And uh, we, we thank the Lord that our churches don't depend upon our creativity or our novelty. Let's just do what the Lord has given us in his word to do. Mm. Um, let, let's look around and realize that this is a lost and dying world. Let's pursue uh, unity within the church as best we can, but never at the expense of truth. Let's articulate that in a good way. And uh, let's ask God to help us grow and to be better. Mm, yes, if we would just stick to that mission. You know, it's it's kind of, I, I have trouble when I finish a sermon series, what am I going to preach next? It's easy when we can just preach, you know, chapter 16 after chapter 15. And likewise, we have to come up with a mission and a, and a program and a philosophy. Well, that's hard. Yeah. We would just use what you've articulated, the mission and the and and the methods of of the scripture, knowing his word, knowing his truth. Ryan, I know you are a young churchman, but I want to encourage you in what you're trying to do here on this podcast, what I know you're trying to do in your local church there. And I know you're also trying to be a good churchman. And I just want to thank you for doing all those things and encourage you to keep after it. Well, thank you very much. We've uh... You know, us, us, the younger generation, have have really benefited from from those who've come before. You know, we stand on on your shoulders, and even learning how to give a a thanks report uh, from from the way you uh, deliver that and and pay tribute uh, to what the Lord has done to keep our focus every year on God's faithfulness uh, to His church. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining the conversation on the Westminster Standard, which is the podcast of Jude 3. For additional resources or to make a donation, visit our website, jude3pca.org. And please come back again next week as teaching elder T. David Gordon joins the program again, this time to discuss the Christian's duty to the civil magistrate, a topic that has been widely misunderstood in recent generations and particularly over the last few years. T. David Gordon will bring a necessary historical perspective to help us hold fast to that faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I'll talk to you then. Thank you.